I think one thing to really consider is what is the person that you are taking an investment from also bringing to the table, which is a mindset that's kind of hard when you're asking for something, right? Yeah. Your, your natural inclination when you ask is to feel grateful for receiving. But when you flip that and think, well, there's a lot of optionality out here for who I could take it from, or I could just not take it, right? If you have that as a backstop of, well, I don't need it. I'm not just doing this to raise to do it. Like OCPO could have continued and existed and grown at a slower clip, but we felt that if we could find somebody that was bringing something helpful to the table, that it would, it would really be worth doing. Welcome or welcome back to the Bombshell Business Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Hurdle, and today we are going to have what I think is going to be an amazing conversation. It's around a topic that I think more women need to be chatting about, and, and it's something that might feel a little intimidating or scary at times, and some of you might have gone through this process and might have something to share, but today's guest is going to walk through his experience and offer perspective to all of us. And we're going to be talking about how to successfully fundraise for your business in a down market. So let me tell you about my guest, Jeff Illulian. 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 Is that right? Perfect. Yeah. Said, perfect. <laughs> you got there. You got there. I got there. <laughs> I practiced it. I said it. And then I overthought it because that's my specialty is overthinking. So <laughs> no, Jeff no, you is, crushed it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff has been in the vacation rental yeah. industry for nearly a decade, and he has set up, managed, and or operated over 250 plus vacation rental properties from cozy cabins in the woods to luxury mansions in Beverly Hills. Additionally, Jeff has successfully grown several businesses and has a passion for interdisciplinary problem solving, which is why I'm super excited to have him on the show, in emerging industries. And he firmly believes that the further you push outside of your comfort zone, the larger that zone becomes. Can you tell why I'm super excited about this interview? With backgrounds in economics and philosophy from Columbia University and a JD from UCLA School of Law, Jeff spent three years as a lawyer practicing business litigation, intellectual property, and cybersecurity before becoming an entrepreneur. In his free time, Jeff enjoys playing music, eating tacos, and of course, traveling. Welcome to the Bombshell Business Podcast, Jeff. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Okay. Most important question so far, favorite taco. Oh man. Favorite taco in general. I'm oh. a big Al Pastor guy. I mean, I love the spit. <laughs> I love when they got the pineapple on the top and they the flick pineapple. it off. Like the pineapple <laughs> really does it for me. So, but it's a close call out here. Uh, I'm based mostly in Southern California in Los Angeles, and there are a lot of great tacos out, down here. Yeah, I would say Al Pastor. Of course, I have Alpha Gal now. That's a long story, but I can't eat anything with hooves for the time being because of a tick bite. But Al Pastor, definitely got to have the pineapple and then like tacos de pescados, but like traditionally street taco, like cilantro, onion only. You don't need cheese and sour cream on that situation. No, you know, look, there's uh, there, every taco truck in LA has their specialty. And some Oof. of them, it's like getting a vampiro, which is like the melted cheese. And it's like all like, oh, crisp down. There's some good stuff out here. So if you're ever in LA, I have a, I have a really nice little taco crawl that I like to do. So. Okay. <laughs> I will definitely get that for you. I don't have any customers yeah. in LA right now. I grew up there. I grew up in Orange County, but, and oh, I nice. like that you're from UCLA, obviously over mm. USC. No offense to any listeners who are USC, but <laughs> all right, let's dive in. So you are the CEO, co-founder of Host GPO. And so let's just start with what is that? Yeah. So Host GPO, we're a buying group for vacation rental companies. So if you are an owner operator or you're a property management company or an interior designer and you need to buy furniture, linens, mattresses, amenities, or you're signing up for services like Wi-Fi type stuff, stay fire, things like that, Wh whatever you're looking for in the vacation rental space, you can go to host GPO, you join us as a member, and we partner with West Elm, Article, Crate and Barrel, Helix, Standard Textile, Rugs USA, Google Nest, Staples, whatever it is to get you the best pricing on our marketplace for your unit. So it's essentially a, a GPO, a group purchasing organization where you join as a member and you get to get access to all the guaranteed best pricing at all those vendors under one roof. Yeah. Awesome. And so you're for anyone like 
a host, like an Airbnb host who mm -hmm. has one or two units, maybe a handful of units that they list on an OTA like Airbnb, an online travel agency for those who don't speak the lingo. Or you can do this for a professionally managed vacation rental management company that might have hundreds and hundreds of properties that they manage on behalf of lots of different homeowners. Is that an accurate? Yeah, pretty much. So yeah, we have a, a three unit minimum to join. But that being said, if you are, let's say, setting up a new home or you have a larger format home or you're a part of an association or you're a part of a mastermind group, th there's a lot of different ways that we're able to accept folks into our group. But ultimately, people from as little as a handful of units up to 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 units are a part of host GPO. And we have over 300,000 units that have signed up to be a part of, of our group. And you know, that's what gives us the power to go out and leverage and negotiate, find the best, curate the best brands, and then negotiate the pricing um, on behalf of the group. So, Yeah, as opposed to running to Walmart and Target and hoping for the best that this stuff is going to last. <laughs> I guess I, I've done guess. it. I've done it. You, you name it. 48 okay. shopping cart, Ikea checkout. I've done the flea market with two giant moving trucks. I've done all, all of the above in my vacation rental journey before starting those GPO to set up all those units. So I'm very familiar with, with all of the mistakes <laughs> and we hope very, very deeply to help people make it easier in terms of setting up and operating their units. And so did host GPO come out of just the pain of that, of like, I cannot go to another TJ Maxx and hope well, for consistency? A hundred percent. It just came out of an infinite amount of failures from like, <laughs> you know, running into Ross and buying like the one set of towels that were there or like the the one sheet and then mixing and matching. And then like our units, we would start to look at them after like six months or a year. And and all of a sudden it would be like an off white pillowcase with a bright white comforter with a and, and all of a sudden you lose like any sense of consistency. And, you know, the last minute purchasing is really the most expensive thing that you can do from a, from a financial perspective. I mean, the most ex expensive stuff is the panic buying. So building out how to have an inventory system and which types of linens to use and all the little things of we used to take a Sharpie and label the corners of all of our sheets. And then we realized that, well, standard textile has like all that done for you already. And they have contract grade hospitality sheets and why like trying to reinvent the wheel a lot for no reason and realizing that hotels and hospitality companies and have already been doing this for years and years and years and they've developed excellent solutions and being able to buy from the brands that they're buying from making them accessible to people that was a big part of what we're doing yeah and i've said this and i kind of get my hand slapped at times and my listeners know that i love straddling both the vacation rental short-term rental world and the hotel world and of course my background is hotel luxury hotel and i say like I love the vacation rental world because it's very entrepreneurial. And I just feel like there's a lot of people who are like me. They're scrappy. There's a lot of grit. There's a lot of familiarity, plus all of that hospitality love fest. But it lacks the sophistication. And that's not a knock. It's just what is. It lacks the sophistication that the hotel industry has built up over decades upon decades upon decades where there's systems and processes and best practices industry-wide. And when your average box is 300 rooms versus God knows how many rooms and hot tubs and pools and like, it's just a kind of a crapshoot of what your experience is going to be in terms of managing vacation rentals. And you're taking that sophistication and pulling it over to provide that same opportunity for property managers and owners. It, it, we're certainly trying to, right. you know, we're trying to pull it over. You know, it's been a journey over the last three, four years, and we're super grateful to all of our members who've, who've stuck with us and kind of gone through the iterations. But yeah, I mean, look, trying to figure out which sheets Marriott uses, that's already hard enough, right? Then you figure it out and then you try to reach out to that company and they just don't sell. They don't sell to individuals. And so, you know, you can kind of try to find it. You can try to buy it elsewhere. You can buy it on Amazon or whatever, but it's going to be more expensive. And so what we've done is gone through and curated and found those brands and then made it possible for you to be able to purchase like very, very small quantities at business to business pricing, not retail pricing. And a lot of the needs of vacation rentals are just very different than hotels. But that doesn't mean that we can't utilize the same things. I mean, ultimately, every hotel room and every vacation rental has toilet paper. And like, right. that's <laughs> the nature of the business. And so we went out and try and found the best pricing on toilet paper to make it you know possible for you to, to get it. So you don't have to go through the, the hassle. I mean, 
it's vacation rentals and, and short-term rental properties are, and I was the same way. I was the entrepreneurial, you know, I broke into the space and I was like, I love doing this so much. I love creating experiences. I love the fact that it was homes. I love the fact that they were all unique, but the needs are very, very different. And so like you were saying, Marriott might need 500 identical paintings to go on the walls of all the rooms, but your vacation rental needs art that feels unique because nobody wants to stay in your home in Austin and look at a picture of the Eiffel Tower. Like right. that just doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so I think as we start to think about as an industry, kind of elevating the experience that guests have and creating a more unique space for people to just enjoy, a, you know, I think it's our kind of goal is to help people not put the particle board coffee tables that are going to peel. And, you know, like, you know, it's not, it's not because it's a, it just because it makes it, I guess, experience It's because it's more expensive in the long run to buy in the, the wrong run. stuff. Yeah. Agreed. So I just want to put a little time out to, to catch our listeners up to where yeah. I'm just trying to take this. So I, I want you to understand the, the whole process start to finish here, Bombshell, because if you have an idea or let's say you have an existing business and you're wanting to add a layer to it, what Jeff and his co-founder did was solve a problem that they knew existed. It was for sure a problem. I'm sure there was some beta testing that went into this, but I also heard Jeff say like, there's been iterations and our members have walked through those iterations with us. Like I'm trying to bring some sophistication yep. to the employee experience in this industry. So <laughs> I get it. So my next question, this might be like jumping ahead, but before we even get into like valuation and like, how did you get your funding and all that kind of stuff? Is that why you chose a membership model is to make that attractive for an investor? Or was there another? It was certainly a part of it. And obviously subscriptions and memberships, when you're looking at valuations for investors have a different multiple that they'll look at. But that also was what we found to be from a business perspective, the best, you know, revenue driver for the business that we wanted to focus on kind of, and that was something that evolved over time. I mean, our kind of concept here was, okay, well, we want to bring this to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And we looked at the business holistically and said, look, we want the, this business succeeds when we get the most people under the umbrella, because for us, it allows us to negotiate new deals and, and increases our buying power, et cetera. And also from a business perspective, the most people will sign up if we are able to provide discounts that they can't get, right? Things that if you go to the website and you type in your email address and get that first discount code or your trade interior design or something like that, like these are normal kind of discounts and we wanted to get something above that. And so those two things together also from a business perspective led us to believe that you know, building this to be more of something like a Costco or something where you pay a very low membership fee, but we have a lot of people under the umbrella was the best way to achieve the business goals of having the most people together to be able to negotiate and get these deals and increase overall spend and being able to pass on the best discounts that we could. So our model was really built around creating a, a, a membership. Well, yeah, and a successful ecosystem for that to thrive in. And and I think, sure. again, going back to, to women in general, not everybody, as my son says, mom, you're not normal. Got it. Okay. <laughs> but most <laughs> most women in my experience, so limited to my experience, um, we tend to worry about everybody else. So it's like, oh, well, I can't charge a membership because like that's what's best for me and my business. And is that what's hear Jeff when he says we chose this model because it's going to help us thrive oxygen mask on first is going to help us be able to have a different level of purchasing power and if the business is healthy and they're not worried about forecasting and things like that and they're not worried about like their P&L being all upside down and it helps with their purchasing it's ultimately better for the consumer so I want you to just, I want to like break this down as we're walking through this with Jeff, like I'm solving a problem. I'm solving a problem that was my problem, but I can see it's a problem across an industry. Now we're going to put a business model in place that we're thinking is the right model, but we've had to have some iterations because business is a test tube <laughs> and we just have For to sure. like try and then see what works and what doesn't and iterate as we go. And we chose this particular model to set the business up for success so that we can then provide a stable experience for our consumers. 
So now we're at the place where you're like, hmm, we need some money. <laughs> yeah. Why did you decide investors were like, as opposed to like self-funding or bootstrapping? Like, where did you come up with that choice? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we had a really unique path relative to a lot of other other businesses. So we we did bootstrap for, for a while, right? We We kind of we started this thing maybe three years ago, well, maybe four years ago in terms of ideation and then really launching it about three years ago. And we bootstrapped it to the extent that we had some small friends and family, individual investments just to kind of keep it going, but nothing nothing serious. I mean, we grinded very, very hard to start to create revenue before we really decided, you know, we were charging a membership fee before we decided to, to kind of go. So we did bootstrap for a while. and. During that phase, people talk about finding product market fit and what that looks like and when you know you have it and all of those types of things. And for us, it was really a roadmap. And I talk about our members kind of coming through this journey with us. And for those of, you know, host GPO members in, in our community that are listening that have been with us for like two, three years, they remember the original website was like, here's an Excel sheet download it, <laughs> type in what you want, type in the SKU numbers and then re-upload it again. And like, that was a really terrible experience that we, we asked people to go through, but there was a desire for what we were offering. The pricing we were offering was good. The goods that we were offering were good and people recognized the value and they were willing to do fairly unreasonable things to place orders. And so <laughs> once we saw that, we started to realize, okay, well, this probably is worth the investment to small amount of investment to make the website better, to reduce the friction of purchasing, et cetera. And so we started it to make it easier and easier and easier to place orders, working with our vendors, you know, all, all the host GPO ordering is, is instantaneous. So you're ordering directly from the vendors and, and a large, to a large degree, it's using coupon codes or, or getting your accounts upgraded on their site so that you can actually just purchase it right away. And we found that that has been something that we wanted to started with the most challenging version, which was you know, typing in SKU numbers one at a time and then getting it to, to that point. So still better than did, putting together Ikea furniture. Yeah, absolutely better <laughs> than putting together Ikea furniture. I mean, man, I, I swear I spoke Swedish for like a little while. I was a confident <laughs> I could like go, I could have ordered a restaurant, but they, you know, I think that we decided to bootstrap for for a long time until we made the decision to start fundraising and there were there were a couple key reasons why we wanted to do it the first one was we saw the product market fit and we felt very comfortable with our community and with what people wanted and we wanted to be able to to grow faster because we thought a couple things one if we keep growing fast that'll actually allow us to get some of these vendor partnerships that are that are even slightly out of our reach right now. And two, we wanted to be able to make the the website even easier to use. And so those were two of the preliminary like primary drivers from a kind of business perspective for why we wanted to do it. And then the third reason was we found a strategic investor that we felt very happy with. And one of our our lead investors is the largest GPO in the US. And so oh, we wow. just closed we, we just closed this round of funding a couple months ago, but they're this enormous company, but they sell mostly to government agencies and corporate worlds, et cetera. And so for us to have them as kind of guides and, and advisors, but also to be able to open a lot of the doors for us that we can't open on our own just by the size of even the vacation rental industry is large, but not that large, you know, when you think of start thinking about Okay. mega business industry. So so that was another kind of key reason. It was one, how do we grow faster and, and really be able to, to keep the same caliber of customer service that we're giving, you know, member support and, and help. But two, can we raise from somebody who is actually going to help us as a business and be able to contribute to what we're doing? You know, money is one thing and you can find money if you look in a lot of places and it comes with a lot of strings usually and you know, you can find it with more strings or less strings or have to, you know, all of that. But I think one thing to really consider is what is the person that you are taking an investment from also bringing to the table, which is a mindset that's kind of hard when you're asking for something, right? Yeah. Your, your natural inclination when you ask is to feel grateful for receiving. But when you flip that and think, well, there's a lot of optionality out here for who I could take it from or 
I could just not take it, right? If you have that as a backstop of, well, I don't need it. I'm not just doing this to raise to do it. Like OGPO could have continued and existed and grown at a slower clip, but we felt that if we could find somebody that was bringing something helpful to the table, that it would it would really be worth doing. Yeah. So, so many things that made me think of, but my immediate thought when you said it's it's a little strange to think, well, what is the investor bringing to the table when you're already asking them for money? But that happens every week on Shark Tank. Like, I want the shark that also has the connections or also has the experience or also has the background or, you know, it's like, I don't I don't just want your money. I want your brain in it as well. Um, 100%. So that makes total sense to me. Now, did you start with like a friends and family round? Can you just walk us through like step one? We looked for funding in this area. Yeah, I think step one, we did a friends and family around with the idea of this. These are folks that either have helped along the way over the first couple years without asking for anything and and were you know, whether that was like, you know, another lawyer friend of mine who had been consulting me throughout or a website friend of mine who I called, you know, 50 times to ask questions about development work early on that I didn't understand or people who have just been mentors and who have been strong. Right. So we wanted to be able to get those folks in regardless of what was going on. And so I don't know how grand your annular you really want me to, to get about this, but like there, you know, for example, like Y Combinator has a lot of, which is a, a great resource, has a lot of template contracts that you can use for things like notes and safe notes, convertible notes, et cetera. And they're all kind of laid out into very specific ways. And so one of the benefits of doing a friends and family round is that you can do a, you know, a convertible safe note that when essentially that means that you're, you're taking funding from friends and family. It's a really simple kind of one, two page document. You might want to make a couple tweaks on it and, and, and look it over, but they do a lot of the lifting for you. And the idea is that you can kind of raise funds from friends and family with the idea that when you end up doing a future round of fundraising, that it will convert into that round of fundraising at a discount. So they might be able to get an additional, I don't know, 20, 30% in the, of equity in the conversion just because they kind of invested in you early. Early. And and so I think that for us, the thought was, well, how do we get our friends and family who have been helping us and who are providing value and, and who we want along for this ride involved and in a way that we can possibly benefit them as well to kind of pay back what they've done for us. So we did yeah. small friends and family round and then kind of started down the investment track. And so did you go into like incubator programs or like how did you find your investor? Because you you're not private equity, right? You're we're like a we're we're a, we're a we're a really strange fundraise that's VC backed, but also kind of private equity backed. It's like a little bit of there's like private equity investment type investment. It's really a strategic investor that is kind of like a private equity arm and then a VC, which on a macro scale, this is what's going on in the world right now. You have a lot of venture capital companies who are asking for things like revenue and track record, and they want post-revenue profitable or close to profitable businesses that have large growth potential, which is very, very similar to what private equity companies generally look for. Right. Um, and that's just because the pools are drying up, right? The the VCs aren't writing checks the way that they used to. They're not really going out there and saying, hey, you have this idea. Here's a check to prove it. And they want to go and find businesses that are already existing and have traction and track record and product market fit that they think can grow and see and see that kind of potential. So I think that the, the economy right now is pushing the types of investments that VCs and PEs are looking for into more of a similar window, which ended up kind of working well for us. But yes, I think traditionally there, there is kind of a difference there. Yeah. And so just to kind of catch up audience l listeners, in 2022, there was more PE and VC money pumped into U.S. businesses than ever in history. And then, of course, the market started shifting and, and and I still don't, I'm still waiting for the recession because I can never get a decent parking spot at the mall or grocery <laughs> store or anywhere. So I'm just like, everything's expensive, but everybody's still buying. So I don't know. <laughs> but as that market shifted, then people started pulling back in the free for all, especially in the vacation rental space was like, Rrr. so 
how did you find your investor, your special kind of hybrid -y, I won't call this person strange, but unique investor? Yeah, well, I think that the, the actual roadmap for how we found our investor was that the truth is I was at a vacation rental conference <laughs> and I was at a conference and, you know, Spencer, Spencer Raskoff, who's the CEO who founded Zillow and, uh, and also founded Picasso, which is kind of adjacently in the vacation rental space was speaking on a panel. And I walked up to him after spoke and wanted to chat with him. And I was like, I know you're super busy, but I would love to just run some things by you. And he was so courteous and chatted with me for a little bit. And I told him about what I was doing and about host GPO. And he said he, he had some interest and, and potentially would be interested. And ended up connecting me with, he has his own venture capital company and he ended up con connecting me with, with somebody on his team. And we ended up speaking and Picasso's a, a host GPL member. So they were already familiar with our business. And that was the beginning of the, the process. And so for me, and, and, and they ended up becoming one of our investors, which is great. They also helped educate me because when you get into the venture capital world, there are a lot of different options. And even in the private equity world, there are a lot of different options. And so we should probably like zoom out for a second and just talk about the fact that we are looking at a very specific investment type for a very specific, like this is for startup funding. If you're doing yeah. fundraising for operating a business that isn't looking at like explosive growth or like has a piece of software or has technology or something like that, like this prop, this route probably isn't the venture capital route. It's probably not for you. Probably that's more of a private equity if you end up going that way. Um, but, and can but when we start, just define yeah. the difference real quick for listeners of venture capital versus private equity? Yeah, I, I think the best way to think about it is venture capital companies. Usually there are there are a couple tiers. You have like the kind of big behemoth companies, right? These are the Anderson Horowitz and Bain Capital Ventures and Sequoia, right? These giant VC companies. And their focus is finding companies like Ubers and Airbnbs and these unicorn type business models that the concept behind the venture capital company is, well, we're going to make a thousand bets. And if one of them really hits, it will pay for the rest of them. So all the other differences aside, the, the structure, who funds them, et cetera, separately, like that is the best way I think to think about venture capital it is these are folks that are looking to find potentially unicorn businesses that will have explosive growth that are traditionally speaking tech companies. Private equity, these businesses or these investment firms are usually built on the model of finding businesses that are growing, but that have, you know, already have recurring revenue, already have traction in place. And they look to invest usually, I believe, to take either a majority share or acquire a huge interest in a, a business. And then with the goal of either operating it profitably or taking over part of the operations or rolling it into other acquisitions that they oh, have. Nice. So things like, you know, yeah, roll ups of, you know, we own this company. It's part of our portfolio. We're also going to buy this company and acquire them and then use them, either roll them together or merge them together. Right. It's more shared of, service uh, opportunities. Exactly. That's that I think is like a very useful way to distinguish between the two. Okay. Venture capital companies usually don't have that type of, of of angle. They're usually more focused on you know, grow, 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 really explosive growth and potentially larger exits. And private equity is usually focused more on like buying businesses, I believe. Cash flow. Yeah. And pri I've noticed private equity is like gobbling up like car washes and landscape sure. companies and like plumbing companies, like just so it's just so different. It's just, I guess what I'm trying to say to our listeners is like, if you don't know where your business fits in all of this, like do your research. And I'm I'm a member of um, ACG, which is the Association of Corporate Growth. And it's all like middle market mergers and acquisition professionals of all different kinds. And like that, that would be a good resource to go to and start like navigating and looking at like, well, what are my options if I want to get in this game? So just some just a little guidance along this journey that we're on. So, <laughs> so you decided that yours was, you had this unique opportunity. You met somebody that introduced you to an opportunity. That was your first like official 
not friends and family around, right? So then what happened next? So then I started to really look at different VCs and different kind of PE companies and start to think about what we wanted as a company, like who who we wanted to invest. Well, then, you know, so then you sit down and you do your business model and you figure out, well, how much do you want to raise? Which is an important question. And that's kind of a threshold question that is hard to figure out because on the one hand, you want to raise as much as possible because who doesn't, when you're looking at numbers, want that. You'd rather have $30 million in the bank than $3 million. Just Not if you don't have a plan a, for it. Exactly. Except <laughs> if you don't have a plan for it. And you know, you're, the more you raise, the more equity you have to give up. And so it, it becomes a kind of two-sided coin and, and you are double edged short and you have to really think about, okay, well, if I raise this amount of capital, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to use it? What's my plan? And kind of put that together. And then once you figure out loosely how much you want to raise, I think it your next kind of step is figuring out which companies invest in that range. So there are a lot of lists out there, but you know, ultimately you're going to have to take a lot of calls. The, the The fundraising process is nothing short of hundreds of phone calls with all different kinds of people. Most of them are things that won't do anything for you, but they're just important learning experiences. But I think certain companies, they have like all check size, right? Like we write 500,000 to $2 million checks, or we write, you know, 2 million to $5 million checks, or certain, certain VCs and certain companies won't write less than $10 million checks. And that really has to do with the size of the funds themselves. And it has to do with the types of businesses that they'll invest in, in terms of growth and returns that they're looking for. And, you know, there's early stage VCs, there's also angel investors, which are kind of somewhere in between maybe friends and family that you don't know and, and early VCs. And so there's different, all the different stages of fundraising, seed, series A, pre-seed, seed, series A, series B. And these things don't really mean anything other than they loosely correspond to check size and like where the business is and maybe the valuation range and maybe the amount of kind of work that goes into the looking. But yeah, pre-seed, seed, and series A it could really all kind of be the same thing. So yeah, I think that I, I think that you start to look at which VCs fit that kind of bucket. And then you start to look at the companies themselves. They usually segment into different, well, you have the, the big, big folks that invest in all different kinds of businesses, but then you also have more niche VCs. So you can have VCs that invest, for example, our RVC invests in prop tech. That's technology that has to do with property or physical space or physical good. Anything from construction to real estate to now short-term rentals, et cetera. They invest in technology companies that are focused on the physical real world. But there's a lot of different types of venture capital companies out there that have specialties. And that's they have the specialties because the people there understand those industries. And because one of the huge benefits of any VC that, that you take or really any investor is their network. And so yeah. when they specialize in one thing, they can start introducing you to people who do that thing. And so I think first you figure out which VCs are, what, how much money you want. Then you figure out like what types of companies write checks like that. And then you start to narrow it down by, you know, what industry, if it's a specialty kind of more niche VC, like what specialty are, are, are they in? And then you get more granular and you start looking at what companies have they invested in? Bad. What's loosely their investment philosophy? And, and then as you kind of go down that process, you know, I can talk for more about like how you choose and if you have the luxury of choice, like how you make that decision and who you want to talk to and that kind of stuff. Well, and then like where, where does the negotiation process fall in when it comes to like how much equity they're going to get in exchange for that investment? Yeah. I mean, I or think, is it kind of like, this is the offer, take it or leave it? I mean, I think the way that most people do it is in a very, very good market, you kind of go out there and they call the whole thing, you know, running a process, right? And so you start the process and then the process starts on this date and that's when you start going out and pitching. And then once you kind of have the first offer sheet, then the process speeds up really fast. Because once somebody gives you an offer, you know, you start talking to other people, you say, hey, I have an offer. And then you kind of line up all the offers, just like if you were buying a house or something like that, right? You know, there's, there's a process where ultimately if, you have a couple of VCs or a handful or, or however many that are all or investment companies that are all interested, ultimately it becomes some sort of like a bidding where they figure out the valuation that way. But what I will say is, especially with venture capital, I think people get really, really, really tied down to valuation. And 
even on Shark Tank, like it's this whole thing about like, I'm only going to give up X percent for this and that. And a lot of people end up walking away from the very, very potentially profitable investments long term because they're short sighted. And I think that one thing you have to think about is ultimately you're trying to raise from somebody who you think is going to help make the pie bigger. Mm-hmm. And you need to get on board with that without obviously be prudent and don't accept any offer. But I mean, if you have the benefit of choosing that, that makes it even easier. But, but yeah, I think, I think people get really, really tied into this whole concept of valuations early on. And the truth is that most companies that raise venture capital, venture capital specifically, private equity is a little bit different, but most companies that raise venture capital don't succeed. Just statistically speaking, it's like very, very rare. They're betting on hundreds of companies, hoping a handful will succeed. And that's just the nature he of He kind of gets their in there and wants to be up in your business a little bit more. And they're going to give you that support, that operational support. You know, their team will get in and be like, we like this. We don't like this. We might hire a consultant for all of the companies. We might plop a consultant into, you know, this investment leg that we have of these industries. And then if it works there, then we'll put it into these industries over here. So, I mean, that's just something to think about as you're considering what your options are and how much support that you need. And and I guess my next question, Jeff, is like, I'm a bombshell. I'm a woman in business. I'm trying to be confident. You know, my business acumen is increasingly improving. I have a team now. I have some understanding of what my predictable revenue is going to be, even if it's not necessarily like monthly recurring revenue. And so now I'm like, I want to take it to a next level. But I've literally like I didn't get my MBA. I don't have any connections. I don't I don't know the players in my industry. I'm just supposed to start picking up the phone and talking to VC people like how how do I even get in the game? (laughs) I mean, look, I think that everybody knows somebody like I think that that's, you know, (laughs) that's a that that right there just rings, you know, I just wanted to trick you into saying that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, look, you you know me like I I know people and and look, private equity companies will they'll also when they catch wind of something, they'll they'll start emailing you. Uh, And just because they're emailing you doesn't mean they're not legitimate. That's just how they find it. Oh, they're emailing me just because of my connections. Amber, can you open the door for us to talk to these people that we might want to invest in? So for sure. And so I think that that is kind of the first, the first thing is, is everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. There's less than seven degrees of separation from every single person listening to this to somebody who is at a private equity company. Yeah. So that's the certainty. You know, I think that there are also... You know, again, we're talking about a very, very specific type of investment for a very specific type of business, right? This isn't necessarily for if you're just starting out and there's all those conversations about, you know, your network and and individuals and friends and family and angel investors, et cetera. By the way, we didn't even talk about crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, which is yeah. a whole nother thing. And you can look at other successful vacation rental companies. Journey just did one and, and um, State Buy did one where they're just crowdsourcing from their members and from their users, revenue, I mean, fundraising, capital. So those two things separate. There are also, just like there are all these vacation rental conferences, there are a lot of conferences that are geared towards investors, where investors go to meet people that are looking for capital. And it's like speed dating. Um, and and they're industry specific and they're tier specific. And so, you know, you can always find something like that. And, you know, the 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 real trick there is I think most of the time, they're not looking to charge the people that are looking for investments to go to those conferences. They're usually charging the investors to go there and meet the folks who are looking for funding. So, you know, I think conferences are always an interesting way to meet people, online communities, et cetera. So I think connecting to people is not the challenge. I think the rest of it starts to become the challenge. I think you just have to have a, a solid set of ovaries too. I mean, like you just have to, that's part of being a bombshell. Part of it is just saying like, I understand my value. I know how to position my value. And that could be your value as the founder CEO or CEO, whatever role you play. That could be the value of the company and what you offer to your customers. It could be the value of your team. But like, that's what I'm all about is the branding side of things like understand your value. And when you understand your value, now you can determine how to position your value. You've talked about product market fit and all that kind of stuff then that's where you start to get the cojones to start knocking on doors and asking for things. And guess what? No's are free. Absolutely free. Doesn't cost you anything to get a no. 
But all of those no's I, I jotted down, it's an important, you're going to make a lot of phone calls and it's an important learning opportunity. In sales, it's really important to hear no and to understand why they said no. Because if that is a, an objection you can overcome, that's going to help you in future sales. If it's an objection you can't overcome, then that might be a product market fit. It's all data. So it, I would assume this is the same. Pro I've never done fundraising. Of course, I've, I work in a space where there's all kinds of M&A activity going on, but I've not personally done it. So my question to you is, is it that same kind of Petri dish, the nose are telling me something too kind of thing? A hundred percent. And I'll tell you, like, I just did this. And if you ask me a month before I started doing fundraising, you know, at the, at the beginning of this year, you asked me at the beginning of the year, how much do you know about fundraising? I would have told you pretty much zero, pretty and much you're, zero. You're a highly educated person with a lot of business Ab experience. Absolutely. But she's never crossed. I never crossed it in my life, really. I mean, look, I loosely knew what private equity companies did. I loosely knew what venture capital companies did. I like reading stuff. I like reading updates and I get, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, you know, but, but I didn't know anything about how the process works, what they look for, what you should look for, how to do valuations, how to do all that kind of structuring. But there's a lot of material. I read a really quick book I downloaded on my Kindle that was like, 50 pages on how to do fundraising, you know, like there are resources out there. And I think exactly what you're talking about, like in terms of talking to a million people and understanding that all, I mean, all of the no's and those no's aren't, they're usually not because of you. The no's are usually because of like, this just isn't a good fit. We don't invest in companies that are like this, or we do invest in companies like this, but we're not doing it right now. I mean, there's all these outside factors that like you and I would never even know about. So for example, like, fund cycle. Like, I didn't even know that that was a thing, but you know, <laughs> VCs usually invest and they have a horizon for when they're trying to return their investment. And so the types of businesses that they may, may look for at the beginning of a fund cycle might start to change based on what they're looking for at the end of their fund cycle, because they're trying to complete, you know, there's all these things that have nothing to do with you that have to do with their business that you can learn over time where, Hey, this isn't a good fit or Hey, whatever. But every time you learn one of those things, you know, it's not even just a no to you. It's just a hey, this isn't a great fit. And every time you learn one of those things, it educates you about the next thing. Yeah. And I would say like, you know, just even in my own entrepreneurial journey, and I've owned multiple companies over the years, to me, it's so helpful to narrow things down through that process. And instead of taking it as like, oh, Amber sucks, I'm not valuable. It's like, oh, that's really not my jam. Like, that's not really where I thrive. Well, like where a business that I lead isn't going to thrive there because like I don't want to understand their industry. I don't like how that industry operates. It's not a fit for like Employer Brand Central. I just hosted our leadership retreat and you know we were we were reviewing, you know, our ideal customer profile and then our anti-customer profile. And other than it put your earmuffs on if your kids are in the car, other than like don't be a dick, like that's definitely an anti customer profile. We all realize that we want to work with companies that do good in the world. And that doesn't necessarily mean nonprofits because I found I don't do well with nonprofits because they have like, not all, but they don't, they have a scarcity mindset a lot. And that's difficult for me to work with because I have such abundant mindset, but like do good in the world, like doggy daycares. They, they do great things for dogs and pet parents. Like they're, they make people happy. Hospitality, you know, creates memories and things like that. And so I think as you go through these no's and you take your hits and you're putting yourself out there, it's a refinement process of what do I want? So instead of taking it as a rejection, take it as like the universe, God, your inner knowing, whatever you want to call it, like shaping you down a path that is your right path and that refinement is required to get you to where you want to go that's my soapbox <laughs> yeah i mean look you 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 have to be resilient and you have to that's that mindset is is essential and and you know you have to take things in stride i think and that's really challenging to do and i can tell you from experience i i used to own a doggy daycare that was one of my businesses i did <laughs> and i learned a lot of things that like, for example, I, I don't want to own a doggy daycare. That's not something I would like to do again. It's, it just wasn't for me, but you know, I think you figure all this stuff out uh, along the road. And again, 
Toast GPO is in a great place right now and we're growing and it's all this all it's it's all good and sunshine and rainbows, but not for a second. I can tell you the the 20 other not just investments or investors that that I that that didn't work out, but also just businesses that didn't work out. Some yeah. do, some don't. And that's just kind of a part of I think part of being an entrepreneur is that yeah. you know, and a business owner is that you you have to be okay to pivot. You have to be okay to to go through things that are uncomfortable and that's just a part of it uh, so such great advice such great advice what would you say like your number one like piece of joy learning like positive experience what's the number one thing that you've taken away just from this exploration process that you've you've been on in in learning how to fundraise and and get the right fit for your business I think one thing that I've found in through this process is, well, look, I think that there is a, there's certainly a validating aspect of it, which, which is nice, right? This, this like confidence that, that when you find the right fit, that somebody kind of believes in your, in, in your kind of, in your vision and, and sees that. But I think what I found even more en enlightening and, re and rewarding through this is that I think you can really start to feel like, especially when you're a business owner, it can be a very lonely place yeah. Uh, and you, it's just you and you can talk to a lot of people and you can tell them what's going on and they might have feedback, but people are in their own lanes and, and that's just life. I mean, people, everybody's busy. And so you can get somebody to look at, look at you and give you some attention and, and focus for a second, but then they're going to go back to their life. And so one thing that I found really great as a part of this process is that I actually feel like I found investors and, and people who aren't just aligned and, and financially, but also care about and and see what I'm doing and focus on it with me, with. Um, which which is just, you know, to feel supported and have and have okay. support like that to run things, you know, even if it's even if it's just you talking and have somebody who's who's following along with you through that process, I think is can be really, really powerful. And and so that that has definitely been a a a light for me in this process, this just to having somebody else there focusing on it with you and, you know, have it, having, you know, that, that kind of support has been great. Yeah. I love that. I, I have so, I like could have a two hour conversation with you, but I do have a couple more questions and bombshell. I know sure. we're going a little bit over today, but I think this is, this is one of those meaty topics that I just don't want to breeze over. So my first of the two questions is, do you have an advisory board that you've put together and, and does does that like involve the VC investor? We've got a lot of boards. So okay. we've got, <laughs> we have, we have a board that is our, you know, our board of, of directors for the company, board. which is, you know, our investors, et cetera. I have my own advisors who aren't necessarily on a board, but who are mentors and advisors for the company. And then we have one currently a host GPO advisory board, which is made up of, of, good number of our members yeah. of different sizes. So very, very large companies, mid-sized companies and small businesses and interior designers who we go to for feedback on what do you think about this new, you know, thing we want to do? How can we do this better? What's working? What's not working? So we have like a product kind of advisory board. We have a, I have personal kind of advisors for the business. And then we have our, our investor board. That's, Awesome. So I'm, I just really want you to hear bombshell that this is not a, a loan thing. This is a get help thing. And then my my second question, or just maybe just conversation is, you know, we, before we hit record, I was explaining to Jeff that women, and I don't have all the statistics, I could pull them out, but women tend to have a more difficult time getting legs in this investment world. And we don't have the same access to this really kind of high level business conversations and mentors and things like that, which we're, we're getting there, we're, we're evolving, but like historically we're just really, really behind, but I, I don't want to like prop Jeff up as like, Oh, well, he's a man and blah, 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 because you're also the son of an immigrant, right? So you had to learn a lot of things from the blocking and tackling that your dad did. So can you just tell us a little bit about that and the mindset that you have because of it? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think I kind of, grew up when my, my father came to this country and didn't, you know, did, had pretty much had everything taken away, kind of started from the ground up and became a business owner. And I think that for me, I benefited greatly from the fact that business talk was always just 
at our dinner table. And my father has a, 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 a business selling, he sells carpets and tapestries. And I think that for him, he always had a very open mentality about talking about everything from like, you know, the customers and what was going on to the underlying business reasons why he was doing stuff or just little things around the house. Like we have a painter and the painter's coming in, it's going to cost this much and, you know, or, or more complicated things. Like I have a partnership and I'm working with this guy and this is what's happening. And I think he was just very open with that stuff. So I, I think that really benefited me in the long run, just in terms of understanding two, two things. One, just being comfortable because I grew up around talking about numbers and, and business that, that just was an inherent thing that I understood because I was, it was open to me throughout my childhood. And the second part of this was this mentality that I think my, my, my father like instilled in me, which was this, you know, when you grow up in a totally different part of the world <laughs> where everything is super different yeah. than when you come here or anywhere, you move somewhere else you learn very quickly that the rules that are in place or the the no not even the rules the norms the social norms or just like the way things are done isn't how they have to be done and you get right. really really comfortable disrupting yeah that kind of stuff so look i can i can talk about a million different ways that i've done this in in my life but host gpo very much came from a problem i was having in my business but also just a a level of discomfort i was having with paying retail price or buying the wrong things, or it just didn't make sense. You, you, you think that when you go on a trip and you book a bunch of rooms for your entire group or on an airline, you get a discount, right? Like this is how businesses work. But the fact that I couldn't do this at my little business, you know, the, there's just a mentality of, well, the doggy daycare started from, I don't like the other doggy daycares that we're bringing dogs to. And this is really expensive. This makes no sense. Like we should, should do it on our own. Or, you know, in my vacation rental business, we wanted to buy a laundromat because we were like, this laundry is like a huge line item for oh us. Oh my and gosh. This doesn't make sense. And everybody, every vacation rental operator that has over 150 units or 100 units at some point has had a conversation about buying the laundromat or his bottom laundromat. This is just part of the thing. So, you know, I, I think that, that those are kind of two of the things that, you know, were very, very you know, beneficial. And then to, look to, to your point, it, it, it certainly is not the same right now. Like it's not, it is very, very much harder to be a, a woman in business. There's no question about it. But what I will say, which is kind of cool is that I have two advisors and one of my advisors is a woman. And I, like, I look up to her unbelievably because she's accomplished so much in her life and her career. And you know, she even started, she has a great LinkedIn group, by the way, which if anybody's listening that is interested, should join called the Old Girls Club. Oh, I like um, it. <laughs> and uh, it's really, it's it's great. It's about women supporting women in tech. And uh, again, I, I think that there are folks out there like yourself, and I think it's a challenging thing, but it's hopefully continuing to get better. Yeah. And it will if we step up. It will if we say this isn't good enough for me. I went in on this game. I'm going to make a hundred calls. I'm not going to have the good girl mentality that I was raised with. I'm not going to be a statistic. I'm going to be a disruptor and I'm going to be a bombshell. I'm going to boldly, bravely, and confidently go out there and do what I want to do. Like it's up to us and it's not easy, but it's also, I mean, my, my neighbors or from the former Yugoslavia, like they could tell you about all the things that they had to contend with to to get to where they are now. We all have our bag. So like play the cards you're you were dealt and play them smart and and fail forward, right? So final question, and I just thank you so much for going over with me and, and letting me gobble up a little more of your time. This has been a very compelling conversation. I ask every guest, what is your final parting piece of advice for a bombshell? Oh man, there's there's there are a lot. I feel like we went through a lot today, you know. <laughs> we did. Um Feel comfortable solving your own problems, be resilient and taking no, be open to pivoting, um, understand that, that everything can be wiped out and that's okay. And, you know, pivoting is a sign of strength, not weakness. Yeah. Okay. So like talking about solving your own problems, right? I think one thing that people don't spend enough time thinking about is, is it really a problem or is it an inconvenience? Mm. Um, and that I think is where I've made a lot of business mistakes before where I've like really gone far down a path 
only to realize that what I was solving wasn't an actual problem. It was just something that was inconvenient. And that's a much weaker place to start from. Yeah. Um, so I really think encourage people who are thinking about solving problems and don't get me wrong. I hate reinventing the wheel for no reason. I hate wasting time uh, on doing that or spinning, spinning wheels. Like all of that is, is terrible. But when you do start to solve your own problem, make sure that it is a problem and not an inconvenience. Yeah. People aren't coming off their cold, hard cash if they're slightly inconvenienced. But if it's a problem, now there's some yeah. cash they'll come off. Yeah, that's a good reason. That's a, that's a good way to figure out if you have product market fit. Um, yeah. if, it's, it's a problem. If you, you know, if you have product market fit, you found a problem. Yeah. Yep. I love it. Okay. So we can find you Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn is all host GPO, the word host with GPO all together. Um, yep. And then you have an offer of three free months of membership with host GPO that we will put that link um, on the show notes, which you will find at amberhurdle.com forward slash podcasts with an S. So podcast plural and um, look for Jeff's uh, episode and, and that uh, will be in there. You can pop into whatever your listening app is and that link will be in there as well. Um, and then every, every which way that you need to, um, you know, find Jeff on LinkedIn and the website hostgpo.com. Um, this has been a really great conversation and I'm sure a little bit different than what you're used to talking about on, on, uh, STR podcasts. <laughs> so I appreciate you opening up your kimono and showing us what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I really, really enjoyed it and I'm always happy to, to come on and talk about this or if anybody wants to reach out and has specific questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Love it. Well, Bombshell, you know what to do. Share this episode with someone that you might think needs this information right now. That's how we keep our community together um, is by sharing and supporting, not necessarily like high-fiving, go-girling in a Facebook group. So um, do that. If you have not yet, please give us a rating and a review. Again, that just helps it be more visible in all of the um, different ways that the web crawlers trick us into <laughs> deciding what we're going to listen to or watch. And um, and I just really appreciate you taking the extra time today and wrapping your brain around a topic that might not be um, something that we talk about a lot, but it is something that I deal with every single week in my business. So if you're not thinking about funding or what it might feel like to be acquired or be invested in, or maybe you should be investing in you know somebody's early friends and family rounds, this, this is a good episode for you to get caught up on. So um, thank you for your listenership and we will see you on the next episode. 